are bird watching. It's relatively common here in the UK, but for a Californian like myself, it is not. Unless of course you count watching the pelicans while I was out surfing in the lineup, or keeping my eye out for a cheeky seagull who was trying to steal my snack. But it's only after six years of being in the UK that I've fully been able to appreciate just how magnificent the birds here are. While they may seem average to you, to myself, well, they're rather exotic. Yes, that's right, even a wood pigeon is crazy cool to someone like me who's not used to them. Which is why during this video, I want to introduce you to three birds that call my garden home and share some rather interesting facts about these otherwise maybe common birds. Then we're gonna go over what it takes to get involved in the RSPV's Big Garden Bird Watch. I am so looking forward to just spending some time looking out over my garden with a good cup of tea from the safety and warmth of my conservatory to participate in some citizen science. So join the safari, hit that subscribe button. Now let's go inside and get warm. I picked the perfect winter's day for my walk to go out and listen to some bird song. However, I forgot my gloves, so it's best we head inside. But before we do, let's first check out the European Robin. First up is the European Robin. They live throughout Europe, Russia, and Western Siberia. However, when things get a little chilly, the Robin may move around a bit. For example, robins from Scandinavia, continental Europe, and Russia may make their way over here to the UK. However, I was surprised to find out that most British and Irish European robins are largely sedentary. They don't move around that much, although some female robins will cross the channel to spend their winters in warmer climates. A recent study looked at European robins and their migrations. It's known that weather ultimately does affect avian migration, but a successful migration certainly depends on the storage of fat and body mass gained at stopovers, which one could say is like our services or rest areas while commuting on a highway. Over the course of nine years, this study showed that the refueling of robins on migration stopovers is substantially affected by meteorological factors. However, what I found interesting was that wind speed did not appear to influence the refueling efficiency of the robins. So even though it was quite windy, they still managed to bulk up to continue on their journeys. Robins are actually one of the few UK species that sing all year round, but their sweet songs well, have a rather territorial meaning behind them. Both males and females will use their songs to declare and defend their own territories outside of the breeding season. When they've paired up, females will stop their singing. However, males will continue to share their song to declare what is theirs. In fact, they will defend to the death in some cases. In some populations, studies have found that up to 10% of adult mortality is because of territorial disputes. So under their cute appearance lies a very fierce defender. Do you have any robins in your garden? Let me know in the comments down below. Whew, it's a good thing my mom got me some nice waterproof boots Thanks, Mom, because <laughs> the walking here in England is muddy and wet. I keep getting raindrops falling on my head quite literally and down my glasses. Oh, but now let's meet the starling. Now this species is not as exotic for one such as myself as you may think. Let's find out why. Native throughout Eurasia, the common starling, well, is a common sight. Birds of a feather flock together. And that is indeed what a group of European starlings is called. They tend to hang out in these big flocks, except during breeding season. Hanging out in a big flock certainly can help protect you from predators, because the more eyes the better when on the lookout for, say, a falcon or a domestic cat. This is a starling murmuration. It's beautiful, 
acrobatic display that starlings tend to do in the wintertime before dropping into their favored roost sites. Not only does the common starling have a high ecological tolerance, but they're also omnivores that adapt to numerous kinds of food. This has helped the common starling be rather common in North America. First introduced in 1890 back in Central Park, not only did they grow in numbers, but they managed to make their way across to the Pacific, up to Canada, and even down towards Mexico. Yet here in the UK, where they're a native species, between 1987 and 2012, they had a reduction of almost 80% in their population. It's believed to be linked to reduced feeding opportunities because of changing land use practices. Speaking of feeding, starlings can sometimes get a bad reputation because they can clean out a feeding station in minutes. Now, they're not necessarily greedy. It's because they live in big flocks that they are evolved to feed quickly. This competitive nature starts when they're rather young. Females will lay about four to six eggs in mid-April. Now, having quite a few siblings can lead to some sibling rivalry. This rivalry can lead to some starling chicks being rather small. However, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some biologists have found that the smaller chicks learn behavioral strategies that help them as adults. As starlings struggle to compete for food in their nest, they'll learn to forage more quickly and put more effort into finding food. So rather than plumping out at the human-provided food, food area, they'll search for hidden morsels through sand. This will help them stay a bit lighter than their heavier siblings who may tend to hang out at the feeding stations and gain more weight, which will make them more vulnerable to predators. So it's not all too bad for the smaller starlings. So even though the weather's a bit gnarly, cold and wet, doesn't mean that you can't go out and enjoy nature. In fact, as my buddy Leo pointed out in one of my previous videos, it's often the best time, because not only is it empty, take a look, no one behind me, and no one ahead of me, but just the beautifulness of nature around me, and lots of beautiful bird song as well. Speaking of which, we're gonna look now at the artist formerly known as Wood Pigeon. That's right, this amazing bird has quite the unique tune that is been very catchy to listen to during lockdown. Now, let's go take a closer look at him. I'll be honest, I've never really taken a closer look at pigeons. However, when researching the wood pigeon for this very video, I came across some really unusual facts that I can't wait to share with you. Firstly, the total weight of all the feathers on a wood pigeon is greater than the weight of its entire skeleton. How crazy is that? Dude, that must be a lot of feathers. It's also estimated that there are about 5.3 million breeding pairs of wood pigeon. Wood pigeons like cabbages, sprouts, seeds, nuts, and berries. In fact, a wood pigeon's crop can hold as many as 150 acorns, a thousand grains of wheat, or 200 beans. Who knew? The fourth weird fact takes a look at their distinctive white neck ring. It takes a wood pigeon 16 weeks to acquire this. However, the craziest thing about wood pigeons has to be their taste in art. In 1995, Japanese scientists found that pigeons successfully learned to discriminate color slides of paintings by Monet and Picasso. The craziness doesn't stop there, because after the training, they were able to discriminate paintings that weren't shown to them during training, as either Monet or Picasso. The scientists then turn the paintings upside down. When Monet's paintings were upside down, this disrupted the pigeons being able to discriminate between the two. Whereas when Picasso's images were inverted, it didn't. They suggested that these results may indicate that the pigeon's behavior was actually controlled by objects depicted in the Impressionist paintings, but was not controlled by objects in the Cubist paintings. Who knew that wood pigeons could be so clever?
Hey guys, so I've got my cozy blanket, cup of tea, and my iPad because we are gonna go through what it takes to be involved in the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch, which is happening this weekend in January. So we're gonna log on to the RSPB's website. It's rspb.org.uk and it says, first up on the page, don't miss out to sign up to the Big Garden Bird Watch, which is exciting. So the 29th to the 31st of January. So we'll click sign up and it takes us through. What's great is if you're a teacher, you can sign up for the Big Schools Bird Watch instead. So you just enter in your contact details and then go into the next section. And then ask a few questions about yourself, like if you've done the bird watch before, I have never done a big garden bird watch before, which is exciting. And then it asks, how did you find out about the big garden bird watch? So you can probably put social media. Well, at least that's how I found out about it. We'll then say that you've signed up to be a part of the flock, which is rather adorable. And you'll be able to submit your results from the 29th of January, because that's obviously the first day that it takes part. And everything that you need to know, like the identification guides, is just here on the site as well. But there's also a section down below where if you want to become a member and help support the RSPB's great work that they do. So I've clicked the here bit to check out what tools they have for us, which includes instructions, which is nice because you can do it at any time of the day, morning or night, and it's just one hour of your time. So it does tell us to ignore any birds that are in flight and to avoid double counting, just record the highest number of species that you see at one time, not a running total. And you can then submit your results online from the 29th of January, but there's also an option to do it by post if that suits. And just like the butterfly count that we did last year, every count is important, even if you don't see anything. Those results still can tell scientists a lot about what's going on in your part of the world. So be sure to still submit if you don't find anything. Ah, so here they have the resources below, which is quite handy, which is why I have it on my iPad, so it's nice and big. I have the bird ID form, which looks like this, and it is fabulous, nice and clear to be able to identify which birds are coming into my garden. Now with that in mind, there's also a few tips that they suggest to make the most of this big garden bird watch. Obviously winter time is a bit tough for birds, and so having a feeder out can definitely help attract more birds to your garden. And it's not just having any old feeder out, it has to be in a safe and secure location. Obviously I have to be very mindful of where I have mine because of our cats. But also what food you put in the feeder can influence what birds come to your garden. Not only is participating in events such as this really fun to do and great to get the whole family involved, but it's important to help continue the data collection that's been going on with specifically this study for 40 years. That's an impressive data set by any means, and it has helped the RSPB identify challenges that are being faced by wildlife. The site specifically mentions the decline in song thrushes. In 1979, it was quite common to see one in your back garden, but by 2019, the numbers declined by 76%. So why not take some time this weekend, just an hour, to watch some birds outside of your house? You can watch from inside a conservatory like I'm doing, or even out of a window and look over a green space if that's available to you. Be sure to check out the RSPB's website for more information, and I'll put the links down in the description below. And while you're down there, let me know in the comments below if you're going to be participating. Got my tea, my ID guide, and my blanket. It's now time for me to take my hour of surveying. I'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. Bye!